Hi, my name is Brian Westbury. Um, I'm uh, to remind you, Chief Economist at First Trust Advisors. Uh, I we are a money management firm out of Wheaton, Illinois, and in a in a way, my day job is to uh, think about uh, how to protect people's assets and grow them over time. And as a result, I get very worried about the size of government, uh, the growth trajectory of government, tax rates and the intersection of policy and public policy with the economy. Uh, also, back in 1995 and 1996, I was the uh, chief economist of the Joint Economic Committee. So I was here uh, when the government shut down uh, in 1995 and 1996. Uh, part of that was over a debt limit vote. Um, it, uh, and I want to remind you that back then the, the deficit was about 4% of GDP. We used the phrase $200 billion, the phrase $200 billion deficits as far as the eye can see. Uh, today, we're talking about trillion dollar plus deficits as far as the eye can see. 11% uh, of GDP versus 3 or 4% of GDP. And so when I uh, compare this back to 1995, 96, I do it for a reason. And that is that the government was shut down. Uh, it was a major political brouhaha, if you will. Uh, we can decide who won, who lost. But in the end, uh, by the late 1990s, early 2000s, we had a surplus in the federal budget. Uh, it was just 10 years ago when the federal budget was in surplus. I remember Alan Greenspan saying he was worried about the surplus because it was going to get rid of all the government bonds in existence and he couldn't run monetary policy if there weren't any government bonds. Uh, that was just 10 years ago. Uh, we now have a trillion and a half, 11 percent deficits and that's why I'm here. Um, I support, uh, as a financial market representative, if you will, and an economist, the use of the debt limit as a tool to get spending down and the budget under control. Uh, not allowing the debt limit to increase, if we were to hold it steady, is not a default on U.S. government debt. Uh, there never once in the past 65 years on a monthly basis have revenues been less <clears throat> than the interest owed on the debt. In other words, as long as we decide to pay the interest, we can pay it every single month from now in to infinity, basically, without a tax hike, without changing anything of the budget today. Uh, by the way, any principal that becomes due, we can roll it over. We'll just issue more debt. It doesn't increase the debt cap. And so the bottom line is we will not default on our debt to foreigners, ruining the United States credit rating uh, if we don't raise the debt limit. Number two, uh, Standard & Poor's uh, reduced the outlook uh, for the American bond market uh, to a negative outlook. Uh, this was reported by some to be because uh, people were worried that the debt limit would not increase. I, anyone who believes that has to go read the statement put out by Standard & Poor's. It was very, very clear. It said the, the uh, Obama administration has proposed four trillion or trillions of dollars in, uh, in deficit reduction. Uh, Representative Ryan has done the same thing. If they were to get together and move in something like this uh, direction, cutting trillions uh, before the election of 2012, we wouldn't put the country on negative outlook. However, we judge, this was Standard & Poor's and I'm paraphrasing, we judge that these two sides are so far apart that they're going to be able to, uh, unable to come together before 2014. And in our opinion, again, I'm quoting Standard & Poor's, that means that the budget is at risk and that, and that, in fact, they were putting us on negative outlook because of the political environment, not on, on reaching consensus about cutting spending, not because someone like the Tea Party is talking about not raising the debt ceiling. 
Uh, finally, I, I uh, was uh, looking at the Bible last night and talking, uh, read about Solomon. Uh, Solomon was considered uh, wise. He asked for wisdom from God. And he was presented with a dilemma. Two women, uh, one baby. Uh, they both claimed it was their baby, and he said, okay, cut it in half. And this smoked out, if you will, the real mother, because she was willing to give up the baby, not have it cut in half. And I look at this debt ceiling debate sort of as that kind of story, that we have to be serious enough about cutting spending and using the debt ceiling as that tool is perfectly in my opinion, logical, it's not extreme, and finally, my final point is, is that global financial markets, they're smart enough to figure this out. They're smart enough to understand the nuances of the political debate, and if the debt ceiling is used as a tool, a weapon of mass discipline, discipline um, I believe that the, uh, the financial markets uh, not only will handle it, uh, but move through it, and, I, and if it works uh, and spending is actually cut, we will leave the other side of this debate in very good shape. I want to remind you again, the early 1990s was the jobless recovery. The late 1990s was one of the greatest booms in history, uh, and part of that boom uh, was because spending was reduced at the federal government level. Uh, we were able to keep tax rates lower, uh, the government fell as a share of GDP, and the private sector exploded upward. This is a very important battle. Uh, I believe the financial markets can handle it just fine. Uh, and what they're asking for is spending reduction. And if the tool of the debt ceiling is used, they're going to be A-OK -okay with that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Mitchell of the Cato Institute. I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, echoing something Brian said, the federal government this year is expected to collect more than $2.2 trillion. The interest on the debt this year is supposed to be about $207 billion. Now, even if we assume that the government forecasts are a little bit off like they usually are, there obviously is more than enough money to pay every single penny of interest on the debt. This is not an issue about default. The Treasury Secretary is being deceitful. The Fed Chairman is being very misleading on this issue as well. Default is not the issue. The issue is whether or not we get government spending under control. I want to make one very important point about this. The deficit and the debt are the symptoms. The underlying problem is a government that is too big and has been a bipartisan problem. During the eight years of the Bush administration, government spending exploded from $1.8 trillion to $3.5 trillion. Obama promised change, but he grabbed the baton and he raced in the same direction with a fake stimulus and Obamacare. That's why we're in a fiscal ditch, because government, under Republicans and Democrats, over the last decade, since we had the surplus Brian was talking about, government spending has exploded. The question is, how do we get out of the mess? If you look at the budget forecast, it's very simple. According to the Congressional Budget Office, revenues are going to increase by an average of about 7% a year over the next 10 years, and that's assuming the tax cuts are permanent. So if revenues are growing 7% a year, it doesn't take a math genius to realize that you reduce red ink if spending grows by less than 7% a year. If we froze spending at the current level, which is what the Canadians did in the 1990s to go from a 10% of GDP deficit to a budget surplus, if we did what the Canadians did in the 1990s, we'd balance the budget by 2017. But even if you let government spending grow by 2% a year, you balance the budget by 2021. And what are our options for achieving that modest bit of fiscal discipline? I mean, I wish we would cut spending, but all we have to do is limit the growth to get to that balanced budget. Uh, the, unfortunately, uh, there's very few leverage points. The debt limit is one of them. If the debt limit goes through without using that leverage to impose some modest bit of fiscal discipline to get us on a track record to undo the mistakes of Bush and Obama for the last 10 years, uh, we will have done a great disservice to our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Reverend C.L. Bryant, and I have been with the Tea Party movement since 2009, where I joined William Temple in Washington, D.C., this town with 1.9 million others of our people. I was proud to be a Tea Partier then, 
I am proud to be a Tea Partier now because the truth was true then and the truth about what we are talking about and have been talking about for these two years is true now. We do not want a fundamental change in the health of this country and what has made it great. And the reason we stand together is to make certain that the core values of this country remain intact. We see that there is a coordinated effort both by Democrats and Republicans to fundamentally destroy the core values of this country on which its financial health has rested and has prospered. We send this message to John Boehner and every rhino on Capitol Hill that we did not give you the gavel of the House of Representatives to play nice with the liberal Democrats. We did not give you that gavel and the great bully pulpit that you have and the big stick that you have so that you would not use it. What is the point and the big stick that you have so that you would not use it? What is the point so that you would not use it? What is the point in having the stick that we gave to you if you're not going to use it to protect the interest of the American people? Now, also, we send this message to those who have, in fact, spoken about changing the very nature and the very reason our army protects this country and the principles that have guided it. The Pentagon has spoken and has told this particular administration that it is not prudent to do the things that they're doing as far as don't ask, don't tell. And as a pastor, as a minister, I speak to other pastors across this country today. It is time for you to stand up and be bold enough to speak to the issues that affect the people sitting in your congregations. It is them who will be affected by the policies of this administration. And let me remind you that it was the pastors and preachers when this country was founded that were hounded the most by the British. Why? Because they were able to inspire passion in the people of this country to be who we eventually became. America is the greatest success story the world has ever known. And I am living proof of it because I stand here as the great grandson of former slaves, but yet today a free man defending the very document, the Constitution of the United States, that made me free and able to speak to you today. So as I leave you, I say to each and every one of you Americans out there to stand up for America. Stand up for God and country. God bless the republic. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, I am Bob Vanderplatz. I'm the president and CEO of the Family Leader out of Iowa. And in front of you here, you have quite a collective group of people. Uh, from a pastor to economist uh, to Tea Party to, to a well-known author um, and then a, a family leader. And you might wonder why, why would I associate myself or why would all of us come together here? It's because we're looking for exceptional leadership. And from my point of view, there is a serious threat to the family if we don't have some real leadership here. Exceptional leadership is a lot like beauty. They are both difficult to summarize and describe, but you know it when you see it. Iowa plays an important role in launching the presidential campaign process, and we take this role very serious. Frequently, I'm asked what I'm looking for in a presidential candidate, and I'm quite up front, and I say simply, we're looking for exceptional leadership. America faces real challenges if we are able to provide the next generation with the hope and stability of previous generations, that their America will be better off than the America of their parents. 
many of the next generation are starting to question that. These real challenges demand exceptional leadership. In 2006, Senator Obama said, quote, raising America's debt limit is a sign of leadership failure. At that time, he was against raising our debt limit to $8.95 trillion. But now in 2011, President Obama and his liberal cohorts are demanding an increase to the $14.3 trillion debt limit to feed their out-of-control spending frenzy. Given Obama's own words in 06, his demand for increased debt today is a sign of leadership failure. Failed leadership from the president demands exceptional leadership from others. This is why I joined with the Tea Party founding fathers and support their Freedom Jam Jamboree coming up in Kansas City on October 1 and October 2 in promoting our country's return to our constitutional roots. This is why we are calling on Speaker Boehner, Congressman Ryan, and many others to courageously step up and provide exceptional leadership. This de debt limit reality provides the perfect opportunity to substantially reduce the size and scope of the federal government, to absolutely refuse to increase the nation's credit card limit, and to begin the long overdue process of entitlement reform. Frankly, this is our only hope for a sustainable and optimistic future for the family. It's not only important that we have exceptional leadership in Congress, but that we elect a replacement for President Obama who can provide exceptional leadership from the White House. At the Family Leader, the organization I lead in Iowa, we are ratcheting up our vetting of the 2012 presidential candidates. When I get a chance to meet with them, I tell them the Family Leader's efforts and initiatives point towards strengthening the family. And that has to do with life, it has to do with marriage, it has to do with the Constitution, but it has to do with this fiscal issue as well. This includes advocating for fiscal policies that give families the best opportunity to thrive financially. Along those lines, and in light of why we're here today, I'm telling Iowans and others across the country that America needs a president that will lead on tax reform, on reforming Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and on drastically cutting discretionary spending. We need a president who not only opposes raising our debt ceiling, but who opposes deficit spending that leads to debt in the first place. A president who will settle for nothing less than a truly limited and balanced budget. And believe it or not, as important as this is, a limited and balanced budget, it's not the fundamental issue. At the foundation of this madness, we're talking about an abdication of constitutional parameters regarding the size and scope of government. We need a president who will hold to the founder's intent regarding the limited role of government in our lives. This is a freedom issue. Failure to do these things is a direct assault on hardworking families across America and a tremendous setback for future generations. We need a president who is more concerned about the next generation than the next election. We need a president who cares more about we, the people, than about me, the politician. And in Iowa, we are leading the charge to discover and to launch that leader. Our standards are high because, quite frankly, they need to be. I invite all 2012 presidential candidates to journey to Iowa, to other states, to the Freedom Jamboree on October 1 and October 2 in Kansas City, to, ch to share their constitutional their conservative, and their optimistic vision for America, which must benefit families for generations to come via exceptional leadership. Make no mistake, regardless of what the president may say, America is an exceptional country. And it demands exceptional leadership. We, the people, will demand nothing less. With that, I thank all my peers up here in their presentations today, and now we'll open it up for any questions from the press. changes in the military to the debt ceiling, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Van Flight, if you, if, if you agree with that. Is that a similar fight to sort of 
put Donato Chantel back into place? Is that the same as keeping the debt ceiling? I think it's it's a ripple effect. When when you start when you start going away from core value issues, the ripple effect leads right to economic issues as well. Uh, Ron Paul was with us not too long ago, as well as some other potential candidates in in Iowa. And some of their comments were, if you tell me where you're at, say, like on the sanctity of human life or on some core value issues, I'll tell you where you're at on economic policy. And so I think when we leave the fundamental core value issues, it will only transfer or translate into poor economic policy, and that's what we're seeing today, and why people aren't willing to grab that leadership baton to get this budget back intact. Do you believe the gay service members who are risking their lives in Afghanistan and Iraq believe in those core values? I'll answer that. Please. I was, you want to cut the light bulb? <coughs> I was in combat in Vietnam. Didn't know what the sexual orientation of any of my fellow soldiers was. And it worked very well. Uh, don't ask, don't tell works. Uh, you didn't ask me when you asked the question what my sexual orientation is. But I'll tell you right now, don't ask, don't tell, and we'll all get along just fine. And so somebody asked, but don't need us. It's private. Some of the Tea Party agree with you that Speaker Boehner, in, in your words, isn't sufficiently leading on the debt ceiling charge. But some of the Tea Party have gone as far as to say he should be challenged in a primary for the next election. Jetson Phillips, Tea Party Nation, his group, and some others. Are you going that far? Do you believe that he should be challenged in the next election? I believe what we're about here today, and I think even in Williams' opening comments he made, is we're trying to encourage Speaker Boehner and Congressman Ryan to demonstrate leadership as well as the other peers that were elected uh, on November 2, 2010. And we're hoping they'll step up, step up and provide that leadership, not increase the debt ceiling, repeal Obamacare. That's why we sent them there in the first place, November 2, 2010. Do the entitlement reforms, slash discretionary spending, but we're looking for leadership. So I think that jury, at least for me, I can't speak for all of them up here, at least for me, that jury's still out. In your press release, you say that you're going to be keeping score, you're going to be watching who votes for, who votes against. So is that, in effect, putting pressure on Speaker Boehner? I, I definitely believe, in. as a matter of fact, that's a Williams press release, but there's no doubt that's putting pressure on Speaker Boehner, as well as other members of Congress, of saying, we're, we're watching your actions, because quite frankly, actions speak louder than words. Hi, forgive me if this is repetitive, but this has been advertised as starting at 10, so I think you have a lot of people coming in now. Uh, what, uh, I heard the first speaker that I heard was calling uh, Boehner and Ryan uh, rhinos, I believe. So who, uh, is that in fact the, the, the message is being delivered here today? And uh, William, why don't you uh, uh, them uh, Maybe if you could just repeat a little bit since we're Well, uh, a, a rhino is a Republican in name only. And all of us in the Tea Party, and I, don't, I think the press will agree that we were highly responsible for Mr. Uh, Boehner, uh, and, uh, and the House uh, Tea Party Caucus, which they call themselves, uh, to get elected. To get elected. And uh, we expect uh, that definition, we are defining them as Republicans in name only, on one issue. If they'll hold the ceiling on the national debt, they're not. If they raise it, they're going to be advertised everywhere, and we're going to run candidates against them, in their own uh, districts if they raise it on that one issue only. But they've already proposed it. Well, and uh, they've got time to change. I think they moved the date to August now. So uh, we're going we're gonna to pressure them some. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what I've noticed, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, re uh, the revenue stream uh, compared to the uh, gross domestic product. And what I noticed is when we increased our spending by $800 billion, um, that took it up to 18 percent, and then we've had a drop off of revenue ever since. Uh, shouldn't we demand, as 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 an obvious mathematical issue, that they cut 800 billion that they incurred or started increased two years ago, and then uh, trend down to 14 or 15 percent 
so that we can pay off some of this debt and contract the monetary base. To me, as a businesswoman, this seems the most logical and prudent action. And as a, a businesswoman, that, that sounds wonderful. My math teacher would probably be all over me trying to figure that one out. But we've got uh, some economists here who can address your question better than I can. Go ahead. Uh, federal government spending when Bill Clinton left office was 18.2 percent of GDP. It's now up to 24, 25 percent of GDP. That's the reason that we're in a fiscal mess. Spending is the problem. Deficits and debt are the symptom. Uh, revenues right now are depressed because of the economic uh, downturn. Uh, but according to both CBO and OMB, they're going to climb back above their historical average of 18 percent of GDP uh, by the time we get to 2020. Uh, so obviously balancing the budget is a simple matter of bringing the spending back down to where it was as a share of GDP when Bill Clinton left office. Isn't that growth based on inflation rather than real growth? I mean, the problem here is, is that they never got to 26. They got to uh, 20 percent in 2000 prior to 9-11. But ever since they've, they've dropped in revenue, we need sincere cuts below the baseline in order to stimulate true growth. And we need to reestablish those markets to get off the bubble machine that we've been deriving our income from. Uh, the percent of GDP data on spending and revenues, uh, the inflation washes out on both sides of the ledger. Obviously, it's bad to have inflation, uh, but that's separate uh, in many ways from the issue of the burden of government spending as a share of the economy and looking at the deficit and debt that accrue because government spending is too high. Yeah, let, let me, uh, Dan, that's great. I, I will agree with everything Dan just said. Uh, one of the reasons that we are having a slow recovery right now, one of the reasons that the unemployment rate is still 8 point, well now 9 percent, revised up by two tenths last much, month, is because the government is so big. And the formula is very simple. The larger the government is, the more a share of GDP we spend, uh, the smaller the private sector is. It's straight out math. Uh, if I borrow and tax to fund the government, that money can no longer be used in the private sector. So the bigger the government is, the smaller the private sector is, the smaller the private sector is, the fewer jobs there are. Uh, cutting spending is good for the economy. Um, and then for you, uh, you, your question about coming in at 10 o'clock uh, um, and missing some things, what I said and, and others up here said was that, that a lot of this today is about the, the debt ceiling and the debt limit um, and that using the debt limit um, is, a, is, a, is a good tool uh, from an economist's point of view to get spending down because it will benefit the economy. So uh, the whole point is cut spending. And uh, if you have to use the debt limit to do that, I, I think it's well worth the effort, the economy will benefit uh, on the other side. I want to inject one more thing here on uh, the whole issue of government, uh, big government. Energy, interior, commerce, none of them are found in the Constitution as a federal responsibility. We've allowed that to be developed over the 80 years, uh, uh, the last 80 years. And uh, we have with us, and he showed up, uh, George Washington, and I want you to understand debt is a moral issue. And so I've asked Thank him you. to say a few words on debt. Thank you. We're here on Monday after Mother's Day. And I said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. Every man, every woman in America and around the world owes a debt to their mother and their father. But that's a debt of gratitude. That's not a debt that we owe because our elected servants have been spendthrifts. They're two entirely different types of debt. In my farewell address on the 17th of September, 1796, I said a very important source of strength and security is to cherish public credit. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible, avoiding likewise the accumulation of debt, not only by shunning occasions of expense, but by uh, vigorous exertions in time of peace to discharge the debts, which unavoidable may have been occasioned by the necessity 
of throwing upon us wars. And throwing upon posterity our debts is a burden that they ought not to bear. A debt is a tax upon the future of America, upon our children and our children's children's children. There is no practice more dangerous than that of borrowing money. For when money can be had in this way, repayment is seldom thought of in time. The interest becomes a loss, exertions to raise it, uh, an imposition on our industry. It comes easy and is spent freely, and many things indulged in that would not have been uh, obtained if it were not purchased by the sweat of one's brow. And finally, in a letter that I wrote to James Welch on the 7th of April, 1799, after I had left the presidency, I said, to contract new debts is not the way to pay old ones. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Temple brought up the issue of ethanol policy, and uh, as you uh, as you know, <laughs> there's probably no area of the country that's benefited more from ethanol policy, from farm subsidies than Iowa, particularly western and northern Iowa. How do you how do you as uh, conservatives in Iowa justify that continued policy? Are you willing to um, uh, abolish and have it abolished? Well, I think we're we're worried when it comes to energy policy. And again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the entire group. I think we're all kind of up here individually as citizens who are um, addressing the need for leadership and reform in this country. Is that in regards to energy, you know, I'm an all the above guy. I think uh, uh, we need to be drilling here. Uh, I think we need to tap into to the energy base that we have here in this country. Uh, I think we need to look at alternative and renewable fuels. I think ethanol is a piece of that. Uh, but I think we, we've also taken a look at, there's been a lot of things that have, have been subsidized and we're, we're saying everything needs to be on the table. This debt ceiling is a huge issue to us. To pass on this type of debt to the next generation, I think it might be one of the most immoral things we can do to that next, next generation. So what we're saying is don't increase the debt ceiling, but let's put everything on the table and let's repeal Obamacare, get rid of or start doing the entitlement reforms, and then go after discretionary spending. But I think all that needs to be on the table. Again, for the later arrivers here, um, just a, a one or two of you could just kind of give us the short summation. Uh, Boehner's supposed to speak tonight in New York um, regarding the debt ceiling, about what you would tell him if you had the chance, and just one or two uh, sentences. To, to sum it up, we're telling Boehner and all the House Republicans they came into office with Tea Party help. We now expect them to hold to their promises and hold the ceiling on the national debt. They can sit on their hands and do nothing, which might be easy for them. And if they do nothing, uh, we won't add to our national debt. We are saying stop raising the national debt and this excessive huge government spending which is bankrupting our nation and endangering the lives of our children and grandchildren. If, if I can add uh, one thing to that, uh, one of the points that we made, especially uh, uh, both Brian Westbury and myself, is that not raising the national debt does not mean default. We have an estimated $2.25 trillion coming into the federal government this year. Interest on the debt is only $207 billion. I think one other theme that uh, you heard from many speakers is that if something as meaningful is achieved, whether it be spending caps, repeal of Obamacare, or some other form of uh, fiscal discipline, uh, that might be a worthwhile trade. But based on what happened with the continuing resolution fight, uh, there's not a lot of confidence that Republicans will actually negotiate with uh, acumen. The debt is an immoral and insidious tax on the future of America, on our children and our children's children's children, as I said. In this Constitution, the preamble, it says, for ourselves and for our posterity, that means the future. We must not place a tax, an immoral tax, on our children. So if, what, what kind of spending caps or other things might be an acceptable trade-off? 
constitutional to limit government. Well, uh, you have all sorts of things. Senator Lee's uh, tax limitation balanced budget amendment. Senator Corker has a, a, a cap act that is sort of an updated, modernized uh, version of Graham Rudman. Uh, you have repeal of Obamacare. Uh, you have uh, just generic spending caps on discretionary spending. There are all these different ideas out there. You know, I, my job isn't to try to say which one is best, which one is acceptable. It's simply to say that during the continuing resolution, they did not get much in terms of negotiation. Uh, and that doesn't bode well for what's going to happen with the debt limit. From, from my perspective, the markets want to see, and Standard & Poor's in their negative outlook on the U.S. said this, the mar uh, they, they want to see some meaningful, lasting, and significant, I, I think they used significant and lasting was their word, I'd call it durable and, uh, I mean, medium and long-term uh, correction to the course that we are on. Uh, because right now we're looking at trillion dollar deficits plus as far as the eye can see. And let me just add a couple of little comments here. I'm in the private sector. I, I told you that we're here before this. Um, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, uh, Wachovia, WAMU, they were all just taken out summarily by the government with with accusatory language of reckless behavior and speculation. I, I mean, if the U.S. government was a bank, the FDIC would close them down this Friday night. They, they have run their fiscal books in an awful manner. And what's, what's interesting about this is that when I have discussions with politicians and some in the leadership who I have talked to in recent days, uh, they're basically saying, well, we need a, a glide path, a, a 10 or a 15 or even 20 or uh, 25 years to fix this because we can't cut it this fast. And my point back to them is the private sector doesn't get that luxury. Right. Nothing, n no family gets that luxury. You either cut spending now, lay people off, or go bankrupt. Um, and so the bottom line is, is that, the, and then, and what's fascinating to me as a private sector economist is that then they turn around and say, I'm being extreme. <laughs> I'm the one who's extreme because I'm saying you're out of control. It's fascinating to me. We need 15 years to fix things. Well, you don't get that luxury in the private sector. And my final point about this is that this is a bipartisan problem. I mean, not just, I don't mean this is Washington, I just mean this was created in a bipartisan manner. You know, Paul Ryan, who I've known for a very long time, I think I met him when he was 19 years old. He was an, uh, an intern to Jack Kemp. Um, I, I love the guy. And for the most part, he is an incredibly smart and free market and capitalistic person. However, he voted for TARP, the Bush stimulus bill, Medicare Part D, no child left behind, and the list can go on, the and so the auto bailout. So, so what, my question to him is, what is he? Is he for bigger government or is he for smaller government? Because I believe we would not be in this position today if it weren't for Republican votes while President Bush was in office and what President Obama and the Democrats have done since then. So this is a bipartisan problem that we are in. Um, and I believe that using the tool of the debt ceiling, I, I, uh, I made the analogy that this is like Solomon saying, give me a sword, I'll cut the baby in half. It is a drastic action, but it is absolutely necessary because neither side will listen, just like the two mothers who claimed that the baby was theirs. And so we need a drastic action to bring, in a sense, uh, re I, I, what I would call uh, an adult kind of behavior to the, bud uh, to the budget of Washington, D.C. Um, private firms laid off people, went bankrupt in this process. The government, for some reason, thinks that it, does, it can avoid that pain, and that's what I think a lot of people are saying up here. And just so uh, we can say it clearly and get it clear in our heads so we can wrap our minds around what is happening here, a trillion dollars 
even if Ryan's budget was to take hold, nine trillion would be added, and then, as William had said, 2063 is when, or 2060 is when this would eventually balance. Now, a trillion dollars, just so the average Joe gets his mind around that. The time of Christ's birth, if we spent a million dollars a day from the time that Christ was born, we would not here today in 2011 have spent a trillion dollars. We cannot sustain this type of spending. It is immoral. It is impractical. And we came today to say that we will not tolerate this any longer. Huzzah. 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 Uh, Mr. Temple, would you say that big government Democrats and big government Republicans are intentionally waging economic war against the private sector? Well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the result. Uh, how do you get, what got Tea Party people out in the street two years ago? Thirteen trillion dollars in debt fostered by the federal government in action. And it's, it's uh, dallying with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And while the American people trusted their government representatives, they were spending like drunken sailors, both parties. So when I came out in Atlanta in February, uh, or April 15th in 2009, and found 40,000 Americans, the largest number of people ever assembled uh, before the Golden Dome, I thought, well, these must be conservative Republicans. And when I started asking them that, they said, oh, no, we're Democrats. I said, how can this be? You just elected your president two months ago. And their resounding answer was $13 trillion in debt. And then independents and Republicans. So this is not about party. This is about the American people being fed up with its government uh, acting like children. Two more questions. Right here and right here. Thank you. Two. <clears throat> It seems a lot of initial steam for the Tea Party came from indignation at Wall Street and uh, insurance companies, finance sector in general. But I haven't heard very much lately on efforts from the Tea Party uh, endorsing reining in finance uh, in, in terms of uh, tire regulation and reforms. That uh, I, I wonder, I wonder if you could square a little bit why the steam seems to have gone away in terms of the financing. Oh, the, the steam's not there. The, the two are in bed together. Uh, we understand that. But it's the government that has the responsibility of oversight and doing what benefits the American people. If Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are being overseen by the federal government and our representatives allow subprime mortgages all over the place, and big uh, business uh, is playing to that. Who has the responsibility to bring it under control? The federal government has the responsibility to not be playing games uh, at the cost of the American people. And so it's the American people. We're not, we're not for uh, a big business getting away with murder, but we understand who has the responsibility to make sure that it doesn't happen. And so we're after the federal government first. But if you're going to have regulation that's going to be tightened up, for example, why would you advocate tight or eliminate well, budgets for the SEC? And well, the, the regulations that the, it, 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 you saw, the 2,500-page health care bill, that's the kind of ridiculous paperwork that the federal government produces in which big business can hide, do their do their things. It's, it's regulations that we need to remove. We need to uh, uh, give uh, the country freedom, not more paperwork. And all of this is one big, one big barrel that our federal government, I'm 60 years old, and the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, the Department of Interior, all of these unconstitutional departments have been created over the last 80 years. They, their power does not belong here. It belongs in the states. So we want to see the, the government cut 
not just both parties talking about freezing spending. We want to see commerce cut. We want to see agriculture cut. And the last thing we want cut first is the Department of Defense. There's waste there, yes, but the first responsibility of government is to protect its people. And they're not doing anything about our borders. They're not doing anything uh, 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 about our debt. And they're just creating their own little world where they can retire uh, uh, on million dollar retirements with their own health care plans. And uh, they've created a House of Lords down here. That's what we've got now. If I can just add something about uh, the financial regulation issue, uh, even before the Dodd-Frank bailout bill, the financial services sector was probably second only to nuclear energy in being the most regulated industry in America. I think that's part of the reason why we got into this mess. Uh, it was government actions like the Fed's easy money policy, the corrupt system of subsidies from Fannie and Freddie. That was the mess. And then when the government came in and bailed out the people who made mistakes, that's what angered the average grassroots American. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we see these stories just yesterday about Fannie Mae wanting another Another $9 billion uh, of bailout money. That's the problem. If people in the private sector want to make mistakes, make bad bets, go ahead. Don't come to the taxpayers asking for money. That's what got the, ta the Tea Party people angry. Uh, I have a question, but to follow up on that, it sounds like you're saying the government's responsible for oversight, but we need to get rid of regulations? I'm saying that the government's too big for its britches. It's not what the founders intention. What we have now in Washington, and we're going to be running around Washington uh, taking a look at all of the big departments. The hu yes, I'm not addressing your question. Go ahead. Uh, well, the other thing is you said you, we could raise the debt ceiling if we just do $100 billion. Could you elaborate on how that would work in, in your mind? What I'm saying is we're not, we come to the card game, and we're not just handing over our chips to the liberals uh, on the other side with the help of our House Republicans. We're saying if you want to raise the national debt ceiling, and we gave you eight, nine, it's in your, in your paperwork, eight, nine things that we might consider, including uh, getting rid of o Obamacare, a uh, $100 billion uh, raise in the debt ceiling, but we're going to play our cards one step at a time. You want to raise the debt ceiling? What are we going to get in return? That's, that's the way this card game is going to get played. Let me just add something to this. I mean, again, we're not obviously uh, all in agreement uh, about uh, specific issues. We're all in agreement about the big picture. But let me talk about this debt ceiling and raising it a little bit at a time. Uh, let's just argue first before we even get there. If we did not raise the debt ceiling right now, forever and ever and ever, all right, it's stuck. It's $14.3 trillion. It will never go higher. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that the government has to run a surplus in that situation because we borrow money from Social Security every month, and that adds to the debt, so we can't do that. So we're going to need to run a surplus of about $150, $200 billion to never raise the debt ceiling again. Then if you pick, what, pick your programs, you can pick two of them, ten of them, a hundred of them. I, I'll take pay the interest on the debt, pay Social Security, pay defense, pay veterans benefits. Let's just do those four things. That's all we'll do. Everything else in the budget, everything else, Medicare, Medicaid, Department of Commerce, Education, Interior, White House staff, congressional pay, everything else has to be cut on average 85% to balance the budget. That's how far out of whack this budget is. So what William is saying is, is that I think, I mean, I'm going to reinterpret it a little bit, is that if we don't raise the debt ceiling, the, 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 the mayhem of, of spending cuts would be so far-reaching and so dramatic that it, literally it would tear departments up and parts of the economy to shreds. Um, you can't cut 85% of all spending like that. All right? So what you need is, we, we, I, I, at least I think, everybody knows deep down that the debt ceiling is going to have to go up at some point, but what, what I believe needs to be done is that it needs to be used as a tool, yes. all right, to get spending cut. And if you can do it a little bit at a time, all right, let's, we're going to raise the debt ceiling for one month. You're going to have to vote on it 12 times this year, all right? 
And, and so the whole point is, is that spending has to get down, and this is the tool, the weapon of, of what did you, what, mass discipline, mass discipline um, that can be used to do this. Um, and so and we can get spending down very quickly. As Dan said, we can balance the budget in six years if we just freeze spending. But the bottom line is, is that we have to get something like that done. And um, uh, I think everybody realizes that there has to be some, uh, uh, some movement in these issues. And, and by the way, New Zealand and Canada both did exactly that, froze spending in the 1990s. They both went from very large deficits to budget surpluses. It is possible to freeze spending. Uh, yes, that might require a short-term uh, increase in the debt limit, but get something real in exchange. And as I said before, that CR fight does not leave us hopeful about the negotiating skill of the GOP. We thank you very much for covering this. We would invite you, uh, we invite all Americans to attend the Freedom Jamboree on October 1st and 2nd in Kansas City. And we would invite those of you who are with the media to cover that. Uh, let, me, and let me make this correction. It's September 30th and October 1st uh, uh, with a morning worship service on the We would invite you to join the Freedom Jamboree in Kansas City on September 30th and October 1st. We're also inviting all potential presidential candidates to be there as well. And again, thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.